All right, good midday to you. If you are just joining us for the webinar, good lunch hour to you. Am I broadcasting? You're broadcasting. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's noon, and we're going to go ahead and get started with our Zoom session slash webinar today. Um, I am Wendy Peters Muschetti. I'm Director of Food Systems here at Live Well Colorado. And I want to welcome you to the Institutional Food Procurement Possibilities in Colorado and Understanding the Good Food Purchasing Model um, webinar today. Um, so just a couple quick notes, um, logistical notes. Uh, this is a Zoom session, so although we are treating it like a webinar, so you will be able to both see our faces and see our PowerPoint throughout. Um, as you do on typical webinars, there is a chat function. So you should see on your um, screen a chat box. You are all muted, and so the way that we will field questions throughout is through that chat box. So you, if you have questions directly for me or for all panelists, um, please feel free to chat questions in as we go. We do have time for Q&A set aside at the end um, of this webinar, but please feel free to type them in as we go and we will sort of work our way through those towards the end. We have scheduled a full 75 minutes for this, so hopefully you've got some food and you're sitting down and getting comfortable to join us for this conversation. So this is our agenda for um, the next 75 minutes or so for us today. So obviously we're gonna do some welcome and introductions and talk about who is joining us today. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, um, honestly, sort of our goals. Uh, I'm on the phone, Live Well Colorado. We have the city and county of Denver here on the line as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, from our perspectives, why, why are we having this conversation? Why are we talking about institutional food procurement today? Um, we're going to provide some information, just uh, some, some snippets or sort of background of like what actually has already gone on, which is a lot and substantive in Colorado around institutional food procurement talk a little bit about sort of that situation and context in Colorado today, like what are some of our challenges and what are some of our assets to move forward uh, with this work. And then we'll have um, really substantive time with the Center for Good Food Purchasing talking specifically about their model. And then we'll have time for questions and discussions um, and next steps. Going, sorry, going back to my PowerPoint, sorry. So this is who you're going to see and hear from today. Um, I briefly introduced myself, Director of Food Systems here at Live Well Colorado. I'm also going to make sure you can see here along with me. Hi, everyone. Um, is Christine Alexiuk, who is um, an, a Master's in Public Health candidate and is working with us here um, at Live Well Colorado, completing her practicum and focusing very specifically on um, sort of possibilities and opportunities um, of working with some of our larger institutions around food procurement. So Christina's on the line is going to present a lot of the work that she's been doing um, to understand what some of those opportunities are. Um, and then we also have joining us, I think you can see him now, go ahead and wave Blake. So we have Blake Angelo, so the manager of food systems development at the city and county of Denver. Um, uh, great recent piece in Civil, Eats, in Civil Eats on the work that Blake is doing in the City and County of Denver, so it's a great resource for people to understand sort of the, the resources and support that Denver is bringing to food systems right now. And then our last two presenters will, from, will be from the Center for Good Food Purchasing, so you can wave as well. We have Alexa um, Delwich, the Executive Director of the Center for Good Food Purchasing, and then Colleen McKinney, who's the Associate Director of the Center for Good Food Purchasing. And just want to spend a couple minutes introducing you a little bit more to Coloradans, to these two women. They both reside on the West Coast. Um, but as I said, Alexa is the executive director of the center, but she's come, she is, is really sort of the, she is the seed in a lot of this work. She worked for and at the Los Angeles Food Policy Council from 2009 until 2015, and during her tenure there is when she really sort of oversaw and led this development and launch implementation of a specific model, the Good Food Purchasing Program, that you're going to hear about more today. Previous to that, she's worked with the United Farm Workers and the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, and she has a Master's of Public Policy from the UCLA. 
Colleen, the associate director of the center, um, also worked at the Los Angeles Food Policy Council from 2012 to 2015. And she was instrumental then in developing and implementing the Good Food Purchasing Program as well, along with Alexa as it grew. She also has a master's of public policy from the University of Southern California, and now she moved on up north and lives in Seattle. So we will hear more from Alexa and Colleen um, in a few minutes as we dive into the webinar. Um, and a couple things I just wanted to say about sort of why this group of people a little bit. Um, both Blake and I will spend a little bit of time talking about sort of our goals of our organizations and, and why we're interested in this topic. Um, but just a flag is that, um, you know, we live well Colorado has been working with the city of county in Denver for close to a year now and really trying to understand this sort of whole concept of you know anchor institutions and who are anchor institutions and these larger institutions that um, you know comprise k-12 schools and higher education and correctional facilities hospital and healthcare systems both of us from a food systems perspective really trying to spend some time figuring out how do we partner with these other kind, types of institutions um, that do and, and can play a very instrumental role in shaping our food system and what it looks like. So um, the city and county of Denver and Livable Colorado have already done sort of one convening last summer of sort of a, a, a small cohort of institutions to try to start this conversation and explore how we could work together moving forward. Um, and as part of our journey, um, it has sort of led us to the Center for Good Food Purchasing, understanding what kind of frameworks are out there around food and food procurement that we can work collaboratively with our institutions here in Colorado around. Um, so I will move on and tell you a little bit more about sort of Livewell's goals, and then we'll hear from Denver a little bit about, again, why is this a conversation that we are really eager to have? Um, so I just wanted to very quickly flag sort of our vision, goal, and strategy that's relevant, I think, from here at Livewell, Colorado. So we have a vision that all Coloradans live in environments with equitable access to the nourishing food and physical activity they need to be healthy. We have many, many goals. One relevant goal in the food, our goal in the food arena is to advance sustainable, equitable, and health-promoting food environments. Um, and one of our very specific and relevant strategies is to increase the availability, affordability, and purchasing of nutritious food for low-income Coloradans and communities of color. And I just wanna flag all this before we launch into this conversation to say, we at Live All Colorado are at a point of saying these are some really lofty and important goals and strategies that we want to advance. And we are at a place of exploration, right? We are looking to see who are the other partners and institutions that we could work with that we think have that, that the influence and the power and the capability to help us achieve some of these lofty goals and have the ability to really bring more equity into our food system, um, which has led us to really looking and understanding more about some of these um, larger institutions and how we could be stronger partners um, specifically in this one arena of food procurement. So that's where LiveWell is coming from. Um, and then we're going to hear from Blake a little bit about City and County of Denver's goals. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's very exciting to be on a webinar with 40 people from across the state who are interested in, in learning more and exploring uh, what might have been a, a little bit of a confusing title for some people, institutional procurement, kind of what is that? That sounds very technical. Maybe how does that fit into to my broader organizational mission or my day-to-day -day work? Um, I'm going to step backwards and, and talk a little bit about about the city and county of Denver and our work here uh, creating Denver's first uh, long-term strategic plan and really uh, provide a little context about how we uh, arrived here today as a partner with LiveWell in, in moving forward on this conversation. So uh, as some of you may know, we have uh, really for the last uh, year, year and a half, been actively undertaking a strategic planning pr uh, process uh, to answer the question of, Two, twofold. Part one, what do Denver residents and businesses envision as it relates to the food system when they think about living in, a, in an incredible city, in a strong, vibrant city uh, here in Denver? And part two of that question is really saying, what is the right role, proper role, and opportunity for government to be engaged uh, in that unfolding, in, in the manifestation of that vision? 
So we here in Denver are extremely fortunate to have uh, literally thousands of food businesses and hundreds of food nonprofits. So it was pretty clear that we didn't want to just jump in the pond and start trying to write grants and, and figure out, you know, how to contribute here and there. But really what we wanted to do was step back and say, well, what do we know now? And so we started with a, a baseline assessment, uh, creatively called the Denver Food Baseline Report, uh, in which we really tried to say, okay, from a food systems perspective, what do we know about food in Denver? That's where we identified the over 2,200 food businesses, the nearly five, somewhere between five and 600 food-related nonprofits, uh, et cetera. With, with that data in hand, we then embarked upon a, a pretty extensive community and industry engagement process where we actually met uh, with community in each of Denver's 11 city council districts, so all over the city, in partnership with 64 community partners who opened the door for us, helped us actually get the flyers and emails out, and really asked the community what their vision was, what it meant to live in a great city and how food could be part of that for them. We also met uh, with 11 different industry groups, which included uh, farmers, so food producers, processors, distributors, uh, restaurateurs, retailers, food pantries, educators, uh, and institutional buyers to really understand all of the different uh, pieces of a system. So how do we understand the food system at both the systematic level and each piece to really understand how they can work together to manifest that vision? Uh, as a result of all of those 20 two meetings. We drafted uh, the Denver Food Vision and released that uh, late last year, very late last year, for community uh, comment and feedback. And what we heard overwhelmingly was there was a lot of support. In fact, 94% of people who participated in providing feedback on the draft vision said they agreed or strongly agreed that this was the right vision for the city and county of Denver. And that vision was that food is, is an integral part of helping make a more inclusive, a healthier, more economically vibrant, and a more uh, environmentally resilient city. Within that, we also identified 11 priorities and 11 winnable goals. Uh, because that uh, draft Denver Food Vision is still in its uh, finalizing phase, we, will, we might see some little tweaks, but I would say these are, are going to uh, definitely make it through into the, the final Denver Food Vision, which will be the mayor's uh, statement. Uh, about where he thinks uh, the city can go and all of uh, our resources can help support over the next 15 years. So we, end, we identified 11 priorities, one of which was, was really focused on advancing city efforts and seeking to persuade other public institutions to preferentially purchase food from local and or healthy food and beverage businesses. So we understand uh, as a city and have through some of our sustainability processes in the past articulated institutional purchasing as one one of those winnable goals. It's something that we can really do uh, and by doing thoughtfully can help move the needle on a number of the uh, really the values integrated and integral to an inclusive, healthy, vibrant, and resilient Denver. Uh, the specific winnable goal we're shooting towards is that 25% of all food purchased by public institutions, including the city, would come from Colorado by the year uh, 2020 for the city, and 2030 uh, is the, the winnable goal for the overall vision. So in order for us to move forward on that, uh, we of course had to uh, start trying to figure out what resources we could bring to the table to uh, beg, borrow, cajole, uh, and otherwise inspire other institutions to take this journey together. Uh, the reality is that Denver uh, kind of walking on this road alone, to looking at how we can shift our procurement is important, but uh, we are an actually a relatively small buyer, uh, particularly when you look at all of the power of our educational institutions, our hospitals, our higher ed institutions, and our other municipal partners in and around the metro area. You start to look at that number and you see it, you know, it, it's probably 10, um, well, it's actually between 50x of what we would do just the city alone. So the power there through this collaboration is really important. We also know some of the challenges that uh, because we spoke to distributors and farmers and ranchers and, and others engaged across the food, uh, the food value chain, the food supply chain, that 
having one customer like the city of Denver uh, would help, but it would be really helpful if there was an ecosystem approach and there were multiple customers. So as we look to sort of build and shift demand and bring the supply side along that we can really look to raise, raise all boats at the same time and make sure we're addressing the demand side and the supply side in this kind of incremental fashion. So uh, as a result of, of specifically the engagement with uh, the engagement event that we had with institutional buyers, we, we came away with three things. Uh, the first was a question around, can we explore some institutional purchasing standards? What, if we're going to work together to do any, anything moving forward, we need to have kind of a, a common base, a common a parlance for us to know where each of our values fit in um, and how we might be able to work together to even push that uh, to some of our distributors and our suppliers and our supply chain. Uh, we also talked about the opportunity, uh, the second opportunity at that event was to, to think about collaborative purchasing. And if we could agree on some, some standards, what could we actually look to buy together? Maybe it would be part of our current contracts. Maybe it would be uh, within the little bit of flex room that we have outside of our current contracts to help sort of pilot and, and move the needle on uh, procurement, really, uh, that's value aligned based on the standards we agreed upon. And then the third, which is more uh, sort of functional, is that we, we agreed to try to meet twice a year as an institutional cohort to continue this conversation, to seek opportunities opportunities as RFPs turned over, to look for these kind of aggregation distribution partnerships, how could we work with Weld County and use some of the food hub-like infrastructure they've put together to help Denver Public Schools and maybe even now Jeff Jefferson County Public Schools. So these, these notions of, of collaboration are core to uh, the institutional procurement cohort work. What I will say is that um, procurement is one of those interesting strategies that responds in a unique way to the desire that we've heard from distributors and producers uh, and, and community constituents to have uh, more organizations with healthier food creating a climate of um, healthy local food access and really starting to shift some of the cultural elements which are so difficult to achieve. Um, and so institutional procurement, uh, though it hasn't always been specified in our community meetings to be exactly uh, direct. So people certainly talk about it'd be great to see the city act in accordance with, with its values, with its visions, but they're not always saying, how do you shift those resources? Um, what we've done internally is we've, we've looked to really understand uh, points of leverage have seen this is institutional procurement is a, is a really unique opportunity. On the farmer side, uh, we have a, an opportunity to uh, leverage some of the most recent research out of the USDA that says for a lot of farmers, direct market agriculture, your farmers markets, your CSAs is a really good way to start growing your business. But for the future of local food and economic opportunity therein, we really have to think about these infrastructure and leverage opportunities that institutional purchasing can provide. From the institutional perspective, uh, we're already spending money on food. In fact, many of us are spending a lot of money on food. Uh, at the same time, we also are being asked by our constituents to live out our missions, to live out our, our values in, in deeper and more integral ways. And so thinking about how, uh, as a small piece uh, of our overall organizational story, food procurement can help us actually do better service to our, our constituents, to our mission, and certainly uh, offer, offers new opportunities for wider and, and more exciting public-private partnerships, citywide, uh, and also regional partnerships, as we've talked about even statewide how do we link to western slope growers how do we how do we link to the eastern plains and what they do well and really help uh, contemplate us in a new way as, as a, a vibrant regional food system so i will wrap up by just saying that uh, we we believe that procurement is a priority we have no idea how uh, we are going to move forward as a cohort and so we are equally as excited to be exploring uh, these options opportunities with you all uh, both on the panel and and on the phone or on Zoom to really understand how we can shift this to, to make it the best possible win-win using resources that we already have and are already deploying towards food. So back to you, Wendy. 
Great. Thanks, Blake. Um, and just one quick note of uh, logistical note too. I see we have 40 people on the line, which is incredible. That's almost every single person that registered, which is unheard of for a webinar. So thank you for spending your lunch with us. Also, if those of you joined just a little bit late, um, again, this is Wendy Peters Muschetti, uh, Livewell, Colorado. We do have a chat box since you are muted the entire time throughout this, and we will have time for Q&A at the end, but please feel free to chat uh, to submit questions um, to people throughout the webinar um, in the chat box that you should see at the top of your screen. Um, so we will do a little bit of back and forth between PowerPoint and actually seeing um, seeing us talk. Um, and I also, for those of you who joined us a smidge late as well, we are recording this. Um, we'll talk about this more at the end, but we will share this recording far and wide. Um, we do have an event coming up on March 14th, which I think you're all aware of. Um, we do want to make sure this, re this recording is available for everyone before we convene in person in March. So I'm going to move on with a little bit more um, background about, um, again, I mean, there's all this talk about working with institutions, and this is work that actually already has happened and been happening in Colorado. So Christine, Christine is going to spend a little bit of time right now um, talking about sort of the foundation upon which this good work is being built. So for the past couple months, uh, Wendy and I have been working on a paper that frames how shifting institutional food procurement can potentially benefit the, out, the surrounding community. Um, in this process, we learned a lot about uh, food system work and institutional food procurement work throughout the nation, um, but our focus being on Colorado. So we know we have a strong foundation here um, that spans K-12, higher ed, uh, our healthcare system. And here are just a few examples um, of what's happening in Colorado, but we know there's a lot more work being done as well. Um, so first off in the K through 12 sector, I'm sure most of you know about the farm to school work um, that's happening that's really revamped local food procurement across our state. In addition, um, similarly in the higher education realm, the real food challenge is an institutional food procurement process that's happening actually at the University of Denver. Um, and they focus on just sustainable, healthy, and green standards within their purchasing. I'm just going to check. Sorry, I'm, it's, it's a little awkward going back and forth between the chat and the screen at some point. Um, yes, we will get to your questions as well. Just if, if I do remember, this is Wendy, I'm sorry, a few of the reports of trouble with the video. If you cannot all see the PowerPoint, could you, could you please chat it in? I think you should be able to see the PowerPoint with videos on the side. If that's not the case, let us know. Thanks. Sorry. Christine. Perfect. No worries. And then um, lastly, in the hospital sector, um, the Healthy Hospitals Compact here in the Front Range is a group of 19 Front Range hospitals that have actually committed to new policies um, that talk more about healthier food, beverages, marketing, and breastfeeding. So there's a lot of different work that's happening in a lot of different sectors in Colorado. Great. Um, and this is Wendy. We're just moving the camera back and forth here. One other additional opportunity that I just wanted to flag, and thank you, Christine, is sort of the, the growth in this work of working with a variety of different institutions um, is what's called the Anchor Institution Learning Cohort. And this is supported by Mile High Connects. Um, it is Metro Denver focused. Uh, they focus on several place-based uh, facilities, higher education, hospitals, for example. And this cohort is a truly learning cohort and coming together to really look at how to do practices around hire local, build local, buy local, through cross-collaboration cross and community engagement across multiple um, you know, anchor institutions, place-based institutions in Metro Denver. So just another example of some really good thinking and collaborating that's going on right now in Colorado, all of which from we are learning as partners as to sort of when to connect and how to connect and how to move forward together. So just a couple of quick more slides before we pass it off to the Center for Good Food Purchasing. Um, we keep asking ourselves here too, as we sort of explore this kind of work is, you know, well, why Colorado and why now, right? Is why, um, you know, looking to different types of strategies and why is this necessary? And the fact of the matter is, and that we all probably know on the phone right now, is that we still have 
um, a lot of challenges and that are related to what we eat and what we put in our bodies and our food system in Colorado. Um, we talk a lot about having the nation's lowest obesity rate, uh, which is true if you're a white adult. It is not true uh, at all if you are a child. Um, and there's very big discrepancies across income and race and ethnicity as well. Um, as we say here, very low income adults have an obesity rate that's actually pushing 30%. Um, and we know that diet is a significant contributor or a protective factor, we like to point out, related to many chronic diseases. Um, and that as simple things we know is that the vast majority of all of us still do not eat the recommended daily amount of fruits and vegetables. So, um, and that this lack of access piece is that, um, you know, lack of access to affordable healthy food has significant implications for low income populations. And about a quarter of Coloradans across the state have um, what's considered limited access to healthy food options. So a lot of sort of data and statistics that a lot of us are really aware of. Um, but just to point out is that um, I think what part of what I see is my job and probably Blake's job is to say, we still, we don't, we th these are not intractable, pro intractable problems. We think that there are solutions and strategies, but it's our job to keep looking at sort of what are other systems level solutions that we can do to address these issues. And we have a heck of a lot of assets. So one thing that I am always astounded by here in Colorado um, is really how many amazing people are doing really incredible work in food systems around the state. But we have, I think, particularly strong infrastructure to do food systems and food policy work in the state of Colorado. And I mean that compared to a lot of other states. Um, we have very active producer associations and producer groups. Uh, we have, you know, food hubs, food aggregation centers really developing all over the state, so much so now that they've come together through the Colorado Food Hub Network. We have a lot of folks working in the anti-hunger and food insecurity space and building local partnerships across the state. We have about 18 or so local food policy councils or local food systems coalitions which have come together through the Colorado Food Policy Network. Um, and just thinking about, as just some examples of other partners that are so critical to working with large institutions. We have very active labor unions. We have incredibly um, powerful parent advocacy organizations in Colorado. We have groups all over the state um, do, doing work with community connectors or community health workers or promotoras that are you know, building some of those bridges with some of our institutions and our communities. So just wanted to flag that we think we're in a really good position in Colorado right, right now to do more of this work because we have some incredible infrastructure partnerships um, to do this work and do it really well. Um, so with that, um, we are going to pass the screen over to the Center for Good Food Purchasing and dive in a lot deeper on what you're all probably excited to hear about is a one very um, a specific process for doing um, this work. So Alexa, take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, and as uh, Colleen will get our, our PowerPoint set up um, as I just introduced myself, but we are thrilled to have the opportunity today to explore with all of you how the Good Food Purchasing Program might be used as a tool to help support and really amplify the, the deep, exciting work that's going on in Den the Denver area. So today we are going to um, explore, you know, some procurement basics, share information on the background, impact, and um, expansion of the Good Food Purchasing Program. Then we'll describe in a little bit more detail how the program actually works and what it means for an institution to participate. And we'll end by sharing a few stories from uh, institutions in Oakland, California, and Austin, Texan, Texas, who are currently participating in the program. So, you know, just to start with some terms, what is procurement? Um, just in, at its most basic, it's the pro procurement, procurement is the process by which food is purchased. Um, next slide. Each year, institutions like government agencies, schools, you know, K to 12 schools, hospitals, universities are spending billions of dollars on food, but often these institutions have no idea where the food is coming from and how it's produced, and that's information that really matters to many of them. Um, Procurement as a strategy to transform the food system has, has gained a lot of momentum over the last decade uh, through food policy councils and a number of other food system leaders and procurement initiatives that Wendy and Christine walked us through. So, um, you know, we've just heard about the amazing work underway in the Denver area, and it's, it's really exciting to see how sectors are coming together to leverage their buying power. 
So the Center for Good Food Purchasing sees public institutions like cities and school districts as really key players in helping to create a more equitable food system for a few reasons. First, you know, for one thing, there are major buyers of food. The National School Lunch Program alone spends over $11 billion on food each year. Public institutions are spending taxpayer dollars to purchase this food, and as policymakers, they have both the opportunity and the responsibility to ensure that public food contracts reflect a community's value. Um, and they really have the opportunity to use the public contracting process to create create greater accountability along the supply chain by asking the companies with whom they're purchasing for stronger commitments related to transparency. And since these are often federal dollars that are being spent, the goal is to make the best use of possible of these limited funds. Public institutions are also community leaders, and when they take a stand, you know, as Blake alluded to, when a public institution takes a stand for their values, others follow. And finally, inst public institutions are critical providers of food to communities often with the least access to good food, including low-income children, seniors, and so engaging public institutions that are serving high numbers of low-income people ensures that good food is a right and not a privilege. The vision behind the Good Food Purchasing Program is to ensure that taxpayer dollars are invested in the local community um, with companies that support good jobs, protect the environment, support regional producers, high welfare standards for farm animals, and protect the health of our communities. Participating in the program is a commitment from the institutions to use their buying power to show large-scale demand for food produced by companies that reflect these values. And that demand will create a market where the supply of good food grows as a result. So a little bit of history on where we started. The Good Food Purchasing Program was developed by a multi-stakeholder working group of the Los Angeles Food Policy Council. And the working group spent about two years developing the policy. It was a collaboration of nonprofit organizations with expertise in labor, environmental sustainability, public health, animal welfare. The group also consisted of um, staff from the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, farmers, distributors, value-added producers, and a few major food service um, providers. So in addition to the working group, we also shared the standards that we developed with nearly 100 local, state, and national food system experts to get their feedback. We wanted to make sure what we were creating was really airtight. And the process began with a lot of research, like I think all of these processes do, and examining potential procurement models from across cities across the country and the working group found that while there was really exciting work happening with procurement that addressed either local sourcing or healthy food you know there there wasn't one single policy that brought all of these different issues together and because of the collaborative nature of the working group and the different interests that were represented at the table the group agreed that a good food procurement strategy should really address the entirety of our food system if we wanted to change it and we couldn't leave any of these values behind so there wasn't an existing template for this um, so they the group created a new model and that model really lifted up five values in equal measure that we saw the slide for previously. Good jobs, the environment, high welfare standards for farm animals, regional farmers, and health. The working group identified the city and the school district as, as key opportunities because together those two institutions were spending um, about $200 million on food each year. The working group was ultimately successful in getting the, the institutions to adopt the program for a couple of reasons. First, they built a robust multi-stakeholder coalition to advocate for the policy. They worked closely with the mayor's senior advisor on food policy, as well as the LA Unified School District's food services director to help navigate the inside channels. Um, and they also hosted a number of listening sessions with key stakeholder groups such as government agency heads, um, distributors, farmers, to ensure that the, the policy was fully vetted. The program was adopted by the City of LA and the School District in 2012, and I'm just going to share a little bit about the story of LA Unified. 
their story shows that in a relatively short period of time, their commitment to values-based procurement could have a pretty significant influence on their entire supply chain. So major success has been through the innovation that the program helped to catalyze within one of the largest school food distribution distribution companies in the Western US that was a key distributor for LA Unified. When the district adopted the program, it really inspired a curiosity and um, interest in the CEO. And he started looking at his business through a totally new lens. He'd never thought about things like, you know, how workers in his supply chain were treated or environmental sustainability. And in one case, he was really inspired to work with one of his manufacturers to develop a healthier, more sustainable bread product. So they developed a whole wheat bun that was made from wheat sourced from a cooperative of sustainable farmers in the Central Valley of California. And that bread, that bun was milled and baked in Los Angeles into 40 million servings of bread products for the students. That, and through this one shift, they were able to create 65 regional food chain jobs. They eliminated high fructose corn syrup, they reduced sodium, the kids loved the buns, and the prices stayed the same. And now that bread product not only makes its way onto 650,000 LA Unified students' plates, but into hundreds of other school districts across the Southern California region. Um, and this you know, really shows the ripple effects that one district can have through their commitment. The district also reduced the amount of meat that they were purchasing by about 15%. And at the same time, they redirected that cost savings towards better meat, including a $20 million contract for chicken produced without the routine use of antibiotics. And given the really, the you know, very real constraints that a school district faces with their budgets, LAUSD thought about how they could make shifts and have an impact um, in ways that worked for them and their budgets. So that meant shifting money towards regional producers that weren't necessarily small producers um, because that would have had a cost impact for them. But um, ultimately, just by redirecting the money towards the local, local producers and local processors, they were able to create you know, over 150 jobs um, in the LA region. So we tested the model in Los Angeles and you know, had some great successes and we expanded them from there. In 2016, San Francisco and Oakland Unified School Districts formally adopted the program and together the participating institutions are spending over $200 million on food every year. And efforts are now underway to expand the program to roughly a dozen cities across the country um, with the potential to shift billions of dollars. And so I'm going to turn the presentation now over to Colleen so she can provide a little bit more detail of what the pro program actually does and how it works. Thank you. So that they can set goal, oh, set goals and meet their commitments. Sorry, I forgot I was muted. Yeah, so just start at the beginning. Thanks, Colleen. Yeah, yeah, okay. So our job at the center um, is really to support institutions in um, meeting the commitments that they set through the Good Food Purchasing Program. So I just wanted to give a quick example um, of what that looks like when we're working um, with a school district, for instance. So a school food service director um, would approach us and let us know that they're interested in doing a, uh, an assessment and participating in the program, and we would work with them to do an evaluation of um, basically showing where their food dollars are going and how their current suppliers are aligning with the good food purchasing standards. Um, then with the backing and support of um, a coalition of local organizations, we assist um, that, that district or that food service director with setting some goals and then getting those metrics incorporated into formal district policy, RFPs, contracts, any of those channels that can help them um, you know, actually have the, the sort of formal um, channels to meet their goals. Um, and then we work with them on an annual basis to measure progress, celebrate their successes over time as they make um, changes and, and progress toward meeting those goals. So at the heart of the Good Food Purchasing Program um, are the Good Food Purchasing Standards. So I'm going to explain a little bit about what those look like and how they work. Um, so as Alexa talked a little bit about, 
um, earlier, we brought together leading experts from across the country uh, to help us develop standards in each of the value categories. So working with experts in regional economics, labor, environmental sustainability, animal welfare, and public health um, to really figure out what were the standards, um, what was the best way to define the, these five values. Um, so the standards set a roadmap for working toward what we see as the ideal food system. So an institution that participates in the program is um, looked to to make change in each of the value categories by sourcing a certain amount of food um, from producers that reflect the five values in the program. So in a way it's similar to LEED certification and that the standards set a basic minimum in each value category, um, but there's incentive in, um, that inspire to inspire institutions to score better um, and better in each of the categories. So there's a baseline and then there's room to grow um, based on the priorities of the institution and the local uh, regional um, coalition. So what does that mean in practice? Um, in certain value categories, we rely on third party certifications. So for example, in the environmental sustainability category, we point to USDA um, certified organic or biodynamic um, as sort of the highest level but we also want you know, room for institutions to get in the door. So we point to other certifications that may not be quite as robust as um, the organic certification, but are an entry point for an institution that's just beginning to make shifts in the purchasing practices. So there's a wide range that recognizes that institutions are all starting in different places and have sort of different levels of capacity based on various constraints, including budget. Um, in other value categories where there aren't food third-party certifications, um, for producers or you know they're they're pretty um, small certifications we also use other strategy strategies so for example in the labor category um, the policy the, the program inspires public institutions to look at their supply chain and take steps um, when companies in their supply chain um, aren't following basic labor law and we provide technical support um, to institutions and in figuring out how to do that um, so I just want to give you an example of how one institution, so Los Angeles Unified, um, how this was sort of put into practice by a local coalition there. Um, so there was an issue between one of the key distributors and the company's um, truck drivers who were organizing to join the Teamsters Union. And so because the district actually had a policy in place um, around how the companies in the district supply chain treated its workers through the program, the Good Food Purchasing Program helped to secure a union contract for, about, for 165 Teamsters truck drivers. And as a result, the employees' base salary increased um, from $13 to $19 an hour. And workers at that company now have health care benefits and more channels to address safety issues on the job. And, and they've also, that company has seen their retention um, of employees increase. So it's been kind of a win-win in that situation. Uh, goals and shifts are in this way are really locally driven so the institutions and the community advocates set priorities around how to increase good food in the supply chain um, so it's really you know really provides that framework and then the center provides sort of a centralized independent evaluation um, that that leaves that takes that some of that burden off of institutions so that they can really focus their central on their central mission of putting the healthiest possible meals on the plates of the folks that they're serving our theory of change involves creating supply chain transparency um, and with that improved information, leveraging the, buy, the buying power of major institutions to drive change in the market. And the work that came out of Los Angeles inspired a national movement. Uh, the power of the program is that it covers a lot of different issues and brings diverse stakeholders together under our common framework. Um, so we work with national partners such as the Food Chain Workers Alliance and the Union of Concerned Scientists who provide important campaign support to local coalitions who are working to expand the program to their cities. Um, so we've mentioned formal adoptions in Los Angeles and Oakland. It's also formally been adopted in San Francisco, um, but we're also actively working with coalitions and institutions to replicate the work in other cities all across the country. So right now they're about nine cities with active campaigns um, and a dozen or so with, um, with active interest in working on this. Um, and they're all kind of working around very different strategies. And I think this is really key that, you know, the local context um, and the local leadership matters and sort of how this is being deployed and how, you know, um, local 
institutions and, and partners are engaging around the work. So some of it's being led by, uh, you know, grass, grassroots groups or worker centers. Um, in some places, it's being led by city government. In others, it's being led by food policy councils. Um, and each model has sort of taken a pretty different shape. But I think what's really exciting from our perspective is that all of these, um, these campaigns, these works, uh, this work um, really shares um, a common um, a common vision and common roadmap. So it feels like a collaborative effort and a national movement. And then to close out, I wanted to share a couple of case studies um, of like examples of how the work is shaping up in Oakland and Austin, because um, they I think they give a little bit of um, flavor to sort of how this is looking a little bit different and how different places are incorporating the program to help meet their their own goals and their own sort of objectives um, on their food procurement work. So Oakland Unified School District was the first institution outside of Los Angeles to approach us um, and our partnership with them has was really the first place where we were able to test this model outside of Los Angeles and see some some impacts and some success. Um, so I guess just to start the the Good Food Purchasing Program was a priority for Oakland Unified because their Nutrition Services Division has really invested a lot of staff resources into their Farm to School initiatives. Um, you know, they're widely known as national leaders for the work that, they're, that they've done, and they wanted to be able to really quantify and demonstrate the impact and evidence for continuing to work on these initiatives. Um, so the Good Food Purchasing Program provided them with an evaluation tool and concrete data to talk about their successes and identify thoughtful and you know, well-measured goals for areas that they want to work and accomplish more. Um, so using the feedback from their baseline assessment and follow-up evaluation, they were able to really set um, really specific detailed goals and a roadmap for where they want to head in achieving goals in the five value categories over the next 10 years. Um, and I think one of the exciting things about the work that they've done is they've been really creative in figuring out how to meet their goals while staying cost neutral. Um, so one example of this was um, the way that they redesigned menu items to stay within federal requirements um, while incorporated items that, you know, sort of objectively do cost more like sustainable beef. Um, so rather than, you know, try to do a one-to-one -one swap out for a ground beef hamburger patty, um, they used a smaller amount of ground beef and used it in a taco format. So then they were able to supplement with black beans and, and that's a cheaper item that also helped them to meet their protein requirements within the meal pattern requirements for school lunches. Um, and so that was a way that they that they thought about the ingredients that they were using um, in a in sort of a, a creative way to be able to do to meet some of their goals. And, and you know, it's a popular menu item that they taste tested with students to make sure that it would be well received. So it's been um, a really successful model for them there. Um, and then I think on the just wanted to share on the local coalition side, um, the Oakland Food Policy Council. Uh, Hope Collaborative, Teamsters Union the, were some of the organizations that led advocacy efforts to get the program adopted in the district, and they continue to support the district in ensuring the program values um, are communicated to students and helping the district meet its goals and monitor progress along the way. So they're a key partner to the district in that process. And then finally, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the work in Austin. So um, the city of Austin Office of Sustainability um, has really been the lead convener of local institutions. So in this way, it looks a little bit similar to how um, Denver has been has been um, sort of working to convene um, institutions that are interested in talking about some of these issues. Um, so they in Austin, they've you know got both public and private institutions engaged um, that are really interested and committed to working on procurement together. Um, and I think. For them, many of the institutions have been engaged in farm to school or other food procurement work, but what got them really excited about the Good Food Purchasing Framework um, was the ability to unify around a common framework to express their regional priorities um, and their successes along the way and in, in, in sort of giving some good um, publicity to the, the progress that they're making in building a regional you know, good food system. So last year we conducted baseline assessments with two pilot institutions, the Austin Independent School District and UT Austin. 
And then both of these institutions have shared with the, the whole cohort sort of their experiences along the way and then their, their how they found um, the baseline assessments to be helpful for them in, in validating the work that they've done. And so they were really, they talked about the way it gave them specific knowledge about areas for, you know, conversations with their vendors to build better traceability systems and get more good food products incorporated in, into their purchasing in ways that were feasible to them. So um, really talking about the value that they found in the process um, to, to help bring more co uh, institutions in their cohort into the, into the fold to participate. Um, so they're now thinking, the Austin Coalition is now thinking collaboratively about how to more fully incorporate um, existing good food suppliers into their supply chains um, and figuring out the role that they play in encouraging other regional farms to become more sp responsible producers around issues of labor and sustainability and so on. Um, and then the city is going to take um, the leadership in terms of helping them publicize the work that they're doing. So we see cities as, you know, the, the, where the most innovative um, ground, groundbreaking work um, at poli in policy starts. It always starts at the local level um, and cities lead the way especially now given the tremendous amount of uncertainty um, of, around what's happening at the federal level. Um, so the, we see our work as, as leveraging the collective buying power of cities and school districts, but also the collective voice of multi-sector coalitions and local leaders to create large scale system change. So we're excited to be, to be collaborating with you on this journey to provide um, you know, one framework to think about in, in the work that you're doing. Um, and with that, I just wanna hand it back over to Wendy to find out if there are any questions follow up so thank you great thanks colleen and thanks alexa so um now is your time to go right into a little bit of um q a so if there is a chat box some of you have already been putting in questions um so if you have any more questions or comments or thoughts for anyone who you've heard today, now is the time to type those in um, and we will sort of moderate that and direct them to the right person. So please type questions away. I did have one question if this was being recorded. Yes, it is. So we will share this um, to all participants and to others afterwards um, to please share. Um, and also I see a couple questions coming in right now. Um, so a question for Alexa and Colleen. Um, I'm just going to read this straight up. I love the very coordinated and integrated approach that you have taken to create this program and policies, and especially the implementation. During the process to adopt this model throughout California and the country, who were the key people and leaders in position that inspired buy-in from those who may not have been as convinced of the merit of this program at the outset? To what extent were those who were doubtful of the program brought to the table during the development of the process and the model? That's a great question. Um, and I'm just, I'm looking at the question again too. So, you know, at the, at the very beginning, I, well, you know, I think one example that is really near and dear to my heart um, that I wouldn't necessarily say they were skeptical, but we, from the very beginning, we engaged the LA County Department of Public Health to be involved in the work that we were doing. And um, because we knew that having the, the county's stamp of approval would, would be, you know, incredibly important for getting the mayor's blessing, the school district's blessing in terms of moving forward. And so the, the, the Department of Public Health, the director of chronic disease, was a member of the LA Food Policy Council's leadership board. And he was, you know, a big supporter of the work of the Food Policy Council, but he was very clear from the outset that his staff could work with us on the nutrition component of the work, but that was really the only piece that he, you know, that he could commit staff time to working on. And the, because for him, you know, the intersections between health and sustainability and animal welfare and labor issues it hadn't been a framework that he was um really that familiar with and didn't necessarily know much about food systems work and so flash forward i think it was three years later he was providing the keynote address 
at a forum with public health directors from across Southern California. And there were, you know, 200 people in the room and there he was standing, talking about the Good Food Purchasing Program, saying that, you know, this was the future of public health and connecting all of the dots between those five values and how, um, you know, health was the intersection across all of them. So I think just, you know, having not only their their buy-in, but then their leadership was critical. Um, in terms of others who may have been skeptical, the listening sessions were really important um, in terms of hearing from, like, you know, the procurement officials that were going to be charged with possibly taking on more responsibility within their departments. And so really getting them comfortable with empowering them with the information around, um, you know, what all of the different food system issues were and how important their role could be in, in working to transform our food system. Um, I think that, that engaging them in that process of learning and understanding was really critical because I, at the very beginning, maybe they were a little bit skeptical, but then it was a learning journey for everyone and they were ultimately, you know, felt very um, excited and proud of the work that they were doing. Procurement is not always one of those things that is um, celebrated. And so another piece that, that Colleen talked, spoke to a little bit was the celebration aspect and the recognition. So each year with the LA Food Policy Council and now as more cities are taking this on, the public recognition, you know, having the mayor, city council, school board provide certificates of recognition for the great work that is happening that's often, you know, invisible, thankless work. It has been a real source of pride and um, accomplishment for everyone that's involved. I don't know, Colleen, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, that's right. We can add there is a... Um, Oops, sorry, Colleen. There is a, um, and a couple of great questions coming in, but a real quick follow-up, just while you're on that point, Alex, there's a question. The LA Department of Health, has there been any peer-to-peer -peer connection between them and other public health directors in other parts of the country? Uh, you know, they are part of the, uh, they, they have a big CDC grant for some of the procurement that work that they're doing through sodium reduction and also, um, I'm not, there, there are two big grants that they receive. So through the CDC, they're networked with other public health departments and, um, and frequently communicate with other public health departments around the work that's happening in LA. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And then we have a question is, so as a farmer, how do I start? Like what are the first steps that farmers can take to engage in this work? Well, I, I don't know if any, if we're the experts here to talk about that, but um, I do think that, so if you're, well, the way that, the way that it, we've experienced we've seen this work in the past is, uh, you know, some of the school districts, depending on size, are purchasing directly from, from farmers and connecting with the, you know, local farm to school lead organization in, in um, a city or a region is one really, really key step. And also, you know, getting a better understanding of who the, the key distributors are, um, and and making those connections there, but but my my guess is that uh, maybe De uh, Blake and and Wendy could speak to this better than me. But there are really important resources out there who are helping to play that intermediary role, make facilitating those connections across the Denver region to get more good food producers in the supply chains of the institutions. But it's you know it can be complicated. Um, but often it happens through, um, you know, the the subcontracting in through the formal procurement process. Um, so I'll kind of stop there because I don't want to take us down a really technical road. Well, no, there's actually a sort of follow-up question I think is related. But Blake, did you want to? Do you have anything you want to weigh in on at all about um, sort of first steps for the farmers? before I move to the next question? 
No, I, I think uh, the advice given was really good. My, my hunch is that when we do this kind of institutional procurement work, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're addressing some, that we're directly addressing like food safety standards and, and trying to reduce insurance requirements or, or do any of those kind of mechanisms directly. I mean, I do think that's fair that some of the boundaries and barriers that producers have experienced are real. And um, that said, I think this is one of the methods, this kind of collaborative purchasing approach, the standards-based, value-based approach that starts to get organizations of, of different sizes and scales to, A, rethink some of those um, insurance requirements, minimum thresholds, seasonality requirements, et cetera, and B, to provide pressure um, from like, okay, now we're actually watching. We're looking at the invoices and also expecting you to tell us where this food comes from. So not just, we don't just have a, a low price um, kind of bid preference, but we've got a, a, a providence or a production methodology bid preference, which has this longer term effect. So I think Alex is absolutely right in the short term, if there are... Um, distributors that are servicing uh, farmers in your area that you can start talking to about pack size, quality standards, insurance requirements, etc. Familiarize yourself with what the baseline is for selling in. And then I would also encourage you to, to contemplate, uh, particularly for, for any farmers shifting from direct market into institutional markets for the first time, what uh, what your, your product availability might look like. Can you provide a pallet a week of a product? Can you provide you know, two to four cases? So what is your, your idea of what that is? And how can you make um, sort of your own business case around that? So when you come to, to conversations with those distributors from the supply side, you've kind of worked out the answers that, that really no one can work out for you. What, are, what volumes do you need? What's a reasonable price point for you? And then from our side, we're kind of working from the, the demand side to say, how can we think about reconfiguring um, uh, you know, recipes so that we can take advantage of, of grass-fed meat, uh, understanding it's more expensive or sustainably grown meat, the example provided earlier. Um, how can we think about it maybe not moving to line item bids, but setting uh, procurement goals within those, um, those bigger bids to, to accommodate and incentivize uh, folks to work a little harder to connect with farmers. So the, there's no doubt in my mind that we still have a long way to go in doing the brokering and bridging uh, for this to be as effective as it can be. But I think those kind of uh, steps um, might help expedite uh, the overall transition. Great. There are um, some really incredible and rich comments and questions coming in, and we'll try to get to all of them. We will get to all of them before we end the recording for sure. Um, but just to kind of stay on this on this theme for just a couple of minutes, there are some more questions. Um, wanting to hear more about participation of farmers in the assessment and planning phases. Um, also, a comment that you said procurement largely focuses on larger farms. Um, I'm wondering if these farms have expanded their crops to supply institutions through through the program. Um, have agricultural providers been encouraged to implement more sustainable farming practices? And any other insight on what this market has meant for your ag partners in general? So any additional comments, Colleen or Alexa? One quick comment I would make, um, in, and in that case, we were talking about LA Unified, um, and they're, and in, I mean, they're the largest buyer of food in the city of Los Angeles. They're huge. And they did at one point work with some smaller producers and it, it wasn't a good fit for the district and it wasn't a good fit for the distributor or the, the farmers um, because the, the scale of LA Unified was just too big um, to, uh, the, the scale was too big for the farmers um, and, and so what the district decided was, you know, at this point, we've got to focus on just redirecting locally with larger farmers. That said, other school districts that we've worked with have wonderful experiences working with smaller farmers. And the way that the standards work is the large farms are sort of the entry point. Um, and then 
the but institutions are encouraged to source more and more from smaller farmers for more points. And so I think one of the important pieces that we learned and uh, other institutions have learned is, is really just you know, knowing what your capacity is and understanding so that there aren't negative impacts on anyone involved in the work. And um, there has been some really exciting work happening in Austin around, as Colleen mentioned in her presentation, beginning to work with some of the producers in the region to say, okay, you know, have you heard of these um, social justice certifications that might not be, um, you know, readily available in the Austin area right now, but, um, you know, how, there's a great opportunity and there's been, there have been producers that are really interested in, um, in, in taking these certification programs on. What they need is support in financing for the certification. And so the city is working to line up um, you know, outside investors to help finance the the producers with the with the certification costs. Um, so those are some of the early stories happening in in Austin. That's I think a great model and exactly what you know we're trying to help facilitate through um, this process. Great. Um, and a couple more questions I want to get to, but first two uh, comments to call out. Um, one, Maggie says thank you for answering the question. Um, also, um, everyone who is on um, should see there's a note from Nana Meyer. It's a, so um, is anyone on the call? So that's to everyone, not panelists, but folks that are participating in the Zoom session. Has anyone started exploring a transformation in the procurement processes within the CU system? So if you're on the line, please feel free to chat back. Um, if this is some work that you're doing within CU and the system anywhere. Uh, one other comment I just wanted to share that came in that's really important to remember um, for all of us is to continue to pay attention to how child nutrition reauthorization unfolds um, over the next year, a couple of years. Um, child nutrition reauthorization, CNR, uh, is the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, the last time it was, it was passed, is the big federal omnibus bill that oversees all of our um, school meal programs um, and the WIC program and some other child food, uh, food programs. Um, but a really good note to self that if, if there is move to block grant funding for school meals, that would drastically affect sort of what we do around things like farm to school and local procurement. So sort of a note to all of us as advocates to pay attention to that. Um, and then, um, so more questions that have come in. Um, there's one uh, sort of asking really about your evaluation process a little bit. Um, there's so many questions, I have to scroll back to it. Um, so wondering more about the evaluation tool of GFPP, um, that we've heard about the third party certification process, but it's unclear how that's done. And can you talk a little bit more about that process and how your progress is measured and reported? Yeah, um, and we're going to talk in more depth about this when we visit on the 14th, so I don't want to like steal too much of that thunder for that presentation, but I will talk a little bit about it. Um, so we, that's really the, the role of the center is to, um, to complete the, the assessment um, and work with the participating institutions to collect data about all of the items that they're purchasing. So we're looking at line item records um, that include um, you know, what the product is, how much money was spent on it, what the volume was, and then what was the source farm that it came from. So really understanding um, back to, as far back to the beginning of the supply chain as possible, where that product is coming from. And then um, we have a pretty extensive database already of, um, of producers, um, regional producers in places where we've already done scoring and national producers. Um, and they're um, categorized or, you know, sort of ranked in terms of their um, alignment with the values um, the, in the program. And then so we cross reference um, suppliers that we get information about from the producers with the suppliers in the database and do additional research on suppliers as necessary um, to be able to ultimately produce sort of a, a report that includes things like the percentages of products that are, um, you know, fit. Uh, meet the standards in the local economies category and then breaking that down um, around whether they're large farms or small farms, sort of as Alexa alluded to, those tiers in the program. Um, so 
So showing, you know, the percentages of the total food that um, an institution purchases that meet each of the five value categories in the program, and then um, looking at, you know, what are those, what are the specific farms, and where are they spent, where do, where are they spending a lot of money, where do they have, you know, you know, opportunities to purchase more food that um, that is, you know, demonstrably meeting those categories. Um, so um, working with institutions to use that information then to sort of set that. Uh, plan and those goals to to in increase um, the amount of food that's meeting the categories over time and then following up um, doing the same kind of process um, in each year to, to sort of track that progress toward the goals. Great, thanks Colleen. Um, so we have a question about really this model working in rural communities and this is a question I've heard before so um, Rachel is on the line thank you for raising it is um, and she also says thank you for this super exciting strategy and model, but um, could you talk a little bit more about um, conversations about how to apply this model in rural communities, especially given very high rates of food insecurity in rural communities, but also sort of the presence of most of our agricultural production in rural communities. Um, so how maybe where you've seen or if you had conversations about how this could work um, sort of in non-metro areas. Colleen, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the Bellingham work? Yeah, I mean, I think that the sort of the beauty of the program is that the framework is it, we have, you know, primarily worked in larger cities. And I think it's very clear looking at the list, of, you know, that we have had on the slide um, that that's the case. But, you know, it's it's sort of universal in the way that the the um, values and the certifications translate across areas. So, um, you know, I think one of the areas that we, we have been approached by that. So it's a, it's a smaller region. It's not necessarily rural, but it is sort of an agricultural um, community um, in um, Washington state is in the Bellingham Watcom area. Um, and so they've sort of approached us to, to start thinking about how this could translate into their context. And so, um, so, you know, I mean, having those, those early conversations um, haven't actually, dived into the um, the baseline assessment with any of their um, local institutions you know they're particularly interested in their school district there um, getting involved but I think that um, you know it's it's an area that you know we have started moving in some places and so it's not um, I, yeah like I said I think that, that that's the nice thing is that it, it can translate across um, different different sizes of regions and institutions so and I think particularly in the rural areas, that cohort approach is really important in terms of, you know, what Blake was talking about earlier, really, you know, getting a clear understanding of, who, you know, who is per, who are the large purchasers and how, how can they work in coordination to, um, to aggregate their demand and, um, and set that vision for the region. So the aggregation is really key. Um, so since this work started out of a food policy council and we have several food policy councils in the state of Colorado, there's a question about, from a food policy council member, um, about strategy really, like if there should be a focus first on getting their city or county, you know, whatever they're based out of, this example is Denver, it's a city and county council, get the city or county to adopt this first or work with the institutions that you're really trying to work with or kind of tackle them both at the same time. If you have thoughts on, on that strategy. Yeah, I can, I can take that one. Um, I think that, well, so, you know, I think in Los Angeles it was the city, um, the city of LA was the first institution to adopt. And that was somewhat important um, to, you know, to the, folks involved in the coalition there from, you know, having the city sort of demonstrate leadership and setting the tone for other institutions in the region um, to get involved. Um, and so then LA Unified was um, the second institution to adopt and they, um, they were really where the bulk of food is being purchased in Los Angeles. The city purchases very little food um, sort of by comparison. And so um, the the actual impacts that we saw, you know, primarily came from LA Unified's participation, um, but, you know, having the city pro provide that leadership role was really important. Um, and then I think an interesting sort of other example um, was in Long Beach, um, where we did 
a little, we've, we've, you know, been working with them to figure out um, how to move the policy forward there. Um, and they, so this is um, LA area as well. Um, and they um, were really interested in, in sort of the same thing, getting the, the city to adopt. And they didn't really have the school district in mind at all. They were really focused um, on, on the city. And then when they actually worked with the city to get information about where their food was coming from, almost all of the food that the city was purchased was being purchased from the school district. So when it came down to what this, you know, in terms of actually being able to, you know, do any sort of assessment with the city, they, they learned that they were going to have to have the school district on board as well. So really understanding that the food that, that, you know, it was, it was key in the strategy for working with the city to also be working with the school district, help them to sort of figure out that they needed to have an approach that, that focused on both um, of those institutions, get, you know, working with both of those institutions and, and getting both of those institutions sort of bought in. So I think that just that, that step of really understanding where food is being purchased from um, was, uh, was really valuable and sort of figuring out what that strategy was for them as a food policy council. And, and I think in terms of um, policy first or working, you know, with the food services director, it, it's a little, and I think you raised this as an, an option as well, the sort of parallel but integrated approach of, of beginning to think about what the a policy and a campaign looks like while at the same time working with the institutions to make sure that there's buy-in um, on the inside because without the buy-in and the leadership from the people who are being asked to make the changes it, it'll be really difficult even if there's a policy adopted um, if you don't have that internal buy-in then a policy is only as good as the implementation so And then we have a question about um, working with institutions that maybe already are doing direct purchasing. So can you talk a little bit more about the model works with institutions that are already do purchasing directly from regional farms versus working with institutions that maybe have contracts with food service providers and ties to their distributors, insurance, and food safety parameters and vendors? Um, not a hundred percent sure that I understand the question. So if I don't answer it, please let me know. Um, but I think, you know, in, so a lot of the institutions that we have worked with are already doing some, you know, some form of local procurement or direct procurement. Um, and so in sort of the relationship, we've been able to help some of those institutions, you know, actually quantify the amount um, in terms of their overall purchasing. Um, and then, you know, I think with the case of Los Angeles, you know, they, they had, didn't have a ton of, um, of this work in place. And so being able to show sort of that like before and after a little bit in terms of the progress that they made was that actually, we were actually able to capture like you know the the total shift that was made and the impacts that were made so you know with with somebody like Oakland where um, they already had a lot of initiatives in place we were you know it, it was more of like quantifying where they are now as opposed to looking at like the complete before they started all of these initiatives and after um, so yeah I don't know if that's really answering the question but that's just a little bit about the experience that we've had in terms of places where there's already work happening versus not. Yeah, I think I think that was part of it. I do think it's about that question of work, like institutions that are have, working with like Sodexo, Aramark, you know, versus ones that are just already doing that direct purchasing. Um, and now the model must, I am assuming, you know, kind of have to adapt a little bit and start in different places, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, working, I mean, with this, many of the school districts ha have their own programs and they, they may buy a small amount directly from producers, but then the bulk of their food is coming from distributors and, but they're not working with a food service management company. I, the, the institutions that are working with a food service management company definitely adds another layer of complexity um, because, you know, they're, they have preferred vendor lists. They have some flexibility in, in um, incorporating more regional uh, 
requested suppliers from their clients, but it, it's more challenging. And I think what we've seen with the food service management companies is often they've never really been asked to provide the details on where the food is coming from. So often, you know, maybe the clients want to know if something's local or something's organic and um, the invoice will specify as much, but this takes it another step farther to say, well, we, a we actually want to know who the producers are. So that requires um, work to engage, it's just another layer of conversation because then the food service management company needs to work with, with their vendors to create that transparency, which, um, yeah, it's, it's all very feasible, but it just, there are definite um, additional uh, complications and yeah, all manageable, but it's, it is a little bit different than working with a food service. Uh, department directly with their vendors. Yeah, no, that makes very good sense. Uh, so I think we have one last question here, um, and then we can wrap up with next steps. But it's just about, um, are any of your purchasing partnerships focused more on fresh produce? Or are there different like price points, value points for processed product? I think they're getting thinking along the lines of like a, the seconds, market for seconds. And you see all of the above. Um, so I think, I mean, in terms of the value, in terms of what's being purchased, I mean, the, the institutions, there's, right, all of the above, um, and they're doing all sorts of really creative things with seconds. Um, but in terms of our evaluation, the, our focus is really on um, the minimally processed, I think lightly processed produce would, would factor into it, but um, we're really focused on minimally processed ingredients that are easy to trace, um, easier to trace than say a highly processed uh, granola bar or something like that. We're not trying to, we're not able to trace all the ingredients. So we focus and the bulk is coming from, you know, those five food product categories, uh, minimally, more minimally processed food categories. Great. Thank you to everyone. So thank you, Alexa and Colleen and Blake and to Christine, who's here with me. I think we got through all of our questions. Um, and as we said, we are recording this and we will send out the link uh, to everyone who participated. We will also be sending this link to anyone who is RSVP to join us on March 14th. So hopefully everyone on this on this call, on this Zoom session, um, is aware of that next step. So we have in the morning of March 14th, is a, a much smaller group. It's really to work with that sort of cohort of institutions that Blake and I mentioned, sort of our next convening um, of a few Metro Denver institutions. We're gonna go a little bit deep with the Center for Good Food Purchasing. And then starting at noon over lunch and then into the afternoon, uh, have a much broader uh, community partner workshop where we hope as many of you or all of you will join us to really talk about what are all the different roles that all of us as stakeholders can play and how do we really engage in this work going moving forward. Um, and then Christine, do you want to close it out by just mentioning sort of the paper and what's coming? And then um, we have a nice resources slide. Yes, slide most definitely. Um, so I mentioned briefly the paper that Wendy and I have been working on um, that's just talking about how shifting institutional food procurement can benefit the uh, surrounding community. And our goal is to have that completely finished and sent out on March 7th. Um, so it is a resource that you can read through before coming to the convening and we really encourage that it kind of gets into the nitty-gritty and the research um, surrounding this topic. So it would be great if you guys could even just take a look, look at the glossary um, or the additional links that can just give you some more information before the convening. Oops, too fast. <laughs> and then we have a couple links here um, and this is just I would say like a lot of the main links that I use in terms of writing the paper, um, but just things that you can kind of click on and get more information based on kind of what stakeholder you are and um, what level of the food system you're looking to focus on. Um, but there's a lot more information out there as well. And that's it. We're just flagging this to see that we, we all these hyperlinks of references and sort of go to resources. Uh, we'll be obviously in this presentation when we send it out. So lots more information coming your way. And thank you so much for all of your time, for all of you. And we'll see some of you on March 14th.
Wendy. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.